Okay, so it will be a great pleasure for me to give this talk uh, in this conference for uh, Von Jones. And um, I mean, uh, I will begin by some recollection. In fact, uh, I mean, uh, I first met uh, Von Jones about 45 years ago when he, he came in Paris uh, because he wanted to have a, a, an advice uh, for a thesis. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I thought about a topic of thesis. And um, I mean, uh, what, what I did was to uh, hand him a paper, which I had uh, written very, uh, I mean, just recently. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, what, uh, so this paper was the following, it was the classification of periodic automorphisms of the hyperfinite factor of type 2 1. And uh, I mean, I thought it was interesting because, <clears throat> in fact, uh, this paper revealed that there was an invariant of such periodic automorphisms, which was um, a complex number. So it was sort of, a, if you want, breaking the, the C symmetry, the charge conjugation symmetry. And eventually, I mean, it led me to find that there was a factor which is not anti-isomorphic to itself. So, I mean, uh, Vaughan uh, started to uh, extend the result of this paper to the case of, um, um, if you want, finite group actions. So this, this was, if you want, the, 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 the first thing that he did uh, to, to take finite, group, finite groups acting so final group actions on the hyperfinite factor. And um, on R, if you want, which is this hyperfinite factor. And that was his thesis. Okay. Now, uh, what I, I should really stress, if you want, is that in my, in my own view, I mean, uh, uh, Von Jones. Von Jones is is really uh, uh, um, a genius, if you want. And uh, in 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 which way I mean, I mean that he was able to to follow uh, thread and to gradually unveil an amazing amount of mathematics by uh, considering the by extending the, this problem if you want by uh, considering sub factors of r so of the hyperfinite factor of type 2 1 and uh, i mean um, his trajectory is absolutely amazing because the first thing that he did was to find out that Sub, to define something which is the index of a subfactor, okay, which is, uh, if you want, measuring uh, uh, the kind of co dimension, if you want, of the subfactor. And, uh, and uh, then he made the first amazing discovery, which was that when you consider the values of these indices, I mean, they, 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 they form a continuum after some value. And otherwise, I mean, they form a, a discrete set which has an accumulation point at this uh, uh, thing. So somehow, if you want, then he began to unveil connections between this result that he found and uh, several uh, fundamental topics in physics and mathematics. I mean, the topics were, uh, first of all, the, the, the models in statistical mechanics. Then, uh, um, uh, the, if you want, also the, the conformal field theory. Conformal field theory. Well, they had a very similar kind of spectrum. Then uh, <coughs> uh, he found the link with Eke algebras. Eke algebras and the braid group. Okay, and, and then he made this absolutely fantastic discovery, which is, um, which is um, the not invariant. And I mean, this was, if you want, something which is absolutely mind-blowing because somehow starting 
from <coughs> the topic of subfactors, you know, something which is very algebraic, which is <coughs> very much, how to say, uh, functional analytic and so on. I mean, he discovered an invariant of knots, which is which was totally new. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I remember having seen a video uh, somewhere, I mean, uh, where one can see Richard Feynman talking about this not invariance of von Jones. So von Jones became instantaneous, uh, instantaneously famous. And uh, I mean, uh, and of course, I mean, you know, very well, I mean, he got the Fields Medal in uh, 1990. And uh, then he continued, I mean, he developed, you know, many um, uh, remarkable properties of subfactors as a kind of generalization of groups. And um, I mean, um, uh, going up to pl planar algebras and so on. And this had a tremendous influence, one can say, on mathematics. Now, <laughs> so as this conference will show in particular. Now, uh, uh, Pierre de la Harpe, um, as uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, proposed um, um, to collect <coughs> in a special volume for Van Jones uh, in Enseignement Mathematique a certain number of papers. And um, I mean, uh, what I will present today is uh, my joint work with, uh, with Katerina Consani um, on uh, um, uh, a topic which is related to uh, what I talked about when, when I talked in uh, Geneva about two years ago, I mean, one and a half years ago, and uh, which at the time was something, uh, how to say, very mysterious. But uh, what we did with Katia is to, to, well, at least partially understand what was behind this. So the topic, I mean, the, if you want, the, the, the topic is a mysterious spectrum where uh, what you have here are, if you want, the imaginary part of the uh, non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So the first is around 14, something like that, and keep going. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, of course, the way we, we would like to think about it is as a spectrum <coughs> of, uh, of uh, a Dirac operator, okay? And uh, I mean, <laughs> so, so what one tries to understand, uh, I mean, is how one could find a natural operator that would have this as a spectrum. And what I showed about two years ago in my talk was um, uh, tentative, I mean, and something which was very tantalizing, if you want, and uh, which was uh, obtained uh, from the uh, paradigm of non-commutative geometry. So the paradigm of non-commutative geometry are spectral triples. So spectral triples are, if you want, the um, incarnation of a geometric space but in a way which is perfectly, uh, if you want, uh, uh, compatible or comple completely uh, born inside Hilbert space with operators and so on. So here, the spectral triple that we were considering with uh, Katia uh, is the following. It depends on a parameter, which is uh, lambda, okay, which is this parameter here. And um, I mean, um, as uh, the algebra is very simple, it's the algebra of periodic functions, but they are viewed on the multiplicative group R plus star, and they are periodic with a uh, period mu, which is lambda square. The Hilbert space is uh, the standard Hilbert space of functions, okay? And the operator is the Dirac operator, so the ordinary Dirac operator for the circle, except for one key uh, difference, of course, otherwise, I mean, if it were just the Dirac operator, you would have a an arithmetic progression as a spectrum. So the, the, the new thing is that you, you condition the Dirac operator by finitely many conditions. And uh, uh, these finitely many conditions are um, uh, sort of if you contained in this projection here, pi of lambda and k. And uh, uh, the, the ordinary Dirac operator is compressed by the complement of these finitely many conditions. So if you want, what happens is that you, you force these finitely many conditions to be in the kernel of the operator. Okay. And so you, you consider this operator here. Now, what is this projection? How is it constructed? Well, uh, it's constructed uh, using uh, uh, the following uh, 
uh, which uh, which is a projection okay which is a, a, what what we call the prolate projection so how is it constructed well it's constructed by using um, uh, very specific functions and applying to these functions uh, this averaging procedure here which is to which we shall see very soon to be related to Riemann sums so so this uh, this uh, operation e is applied to functions and uh, because of the uh, uh, Poisson formula what one has is that if you replace a function f by its Fourier transform then you replace this epsilon of f by uh, changing the variable x to x inverse i mean uh, with some boundary condition imposed on functions okay but now to which functions f is this applied well these functions come from um, they are called the prolate spheroidal uh, wave functions psi m they are very concrete functions i mean uh, they, they are if you want uh, available on the computer and uh, uh, they are uh, solutions of the following equation. If you want, they are eigenvalues of the truncated Fourier transform. So in other words, when you take this function psi m and you take its Fourier transform, okay, which is this function, when you restrict this Fourier transform to the interval minus lambda lambda, you find a multiple of the original function. Okay, so this is the, the uh, equation. This is a basic equation. And uh, um, so these functions are perfectly computable, and they came from uh, the work of um, uh, Slepian, Polak, and Landau in the 60s. And uh, we were working in Bell Lab. And uh, I mean, they came out from a very concrete problem, which is a, a problem which is a paradox in communication of signals which is that uh, if you want when, um, okay, for instance, when you hear my talk, the duration of the signal is limited. So I'm limited to, I don't know, something like less than an hour. And the range of frequencies is limited because of course, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, the frequencies I am using uh, in a fixed interval. But the paradox is the following. The paradox is that if you try to find functions which have compact support, Okay, in, a, in say minus lambda lambda. And uh, so functions like that, and which are such that their Fourier transform also has compact support. So well, this is impossible because if you take a function which has compact support, its Fourier transform is a holomorphic function. So it cannot vanish somewhere without vanishing everywhere. So uh, what uh, Slepian and Polak found is that if you want, what happens is that uh, in fact, the prolate spheroidal functions, which were defined by the eigenvalue problem, which I showed you before, in fact, what they do, they compute the angle between the two projections where P lambda is the projection on the functions which vanish outside the interval minus lambda lambda, and P lambda at is, is the Fourier transform. So P lambda at is, is a conjugate, if you want, of P lambda by the Fourier transform, okay. Now, uh, so what happens is the psi m satisfies this relation here by the fact that they are eigenvalues for the truncated Fourier transform. And in fact, what they compute, they compute the cosine, so the chi of mu m, these eigenvalues, when you raise them to the square, they are in fact computing the cosine square of the angle of the two projections. And so saying that the two projections, of course, they don't intersect, but saying that they almost intersect is saying that their angle, the cosine of their angle, is almost one. So their angle is almost zero. Now, the angle of two projections, it's a very simple fact. It's an operator, and this operator has eigenvalues. And when you look at the eigenvalues of the angle between the projections P lambda and P lambda at, okay, the eigenvalues will have a certain behavior. But the eigenfunctions will be these, these eigenfunctions, the psi m. Okay. So the behavior of the eigenvalues now, this mu is equal to lambda square. Okay. Yeah, it will always be the same. So the behavior of the uh, 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 cosine square, if you want, so of the angle will be like this. The cosine will be almost equal to one for some time. 
until you reach the value which is governed by, if you want, the counting of the quantum states which are available. Because if you if you truncate, if you want, if you want the functions to have support between minus lambda and lambda, and the Fourier transform also to have support between the same thing, then this singles out a certain number of quantum states, which is something like four lambda square. So what happens is that uh, I, the the angle is almost zero until you reach this quantum value, if you want this uh, this estimate, and then it it drops and then okay the cosine square is essentially zero i mean it's zero with an incredible precision which means that the two projections are orthogonal when you decompose them okay so this is what happens and uh, uh, so i mean one can plot if you want uh, the graph of these functions uh, uh, when you vary the mu here okay now, uh, and for the corresponding eigenvalue, so the five, which is here, means that you look at the fifth eigenvalue and so on. Okay, so now what I had explained uh, about two years ago was that uh, then what one can do, one can look at this condition Dirac operator, which I had uh, showed before, okay, so one can look at this Dirac operator conditioned by this projection by of lambda k, and one can look at its spectrum. And the great fact, I mean, which is uh, you know, which is quite surprising at first. I mean, when you look, is that then you can compute it for various values of mu, and uh, you can compare its spectrum with uh, zeros of zeta. Now, so okay, one can take uh, very small values. Of course, one shouldn't expect much when you take small values. But for instance, when you take mu equals 5.5, remember that mu was lambda squared, so lam lambda is, is very small. Okay, then what you find out is that <coughs> the angle, or here is a cosine square, huh? so the angle of the operator is, is very, very close to, to zero, okay, for several values here, okay. And uh, and then okay then it changes, but when you take the the range in which the angle is almost zero, and you compute the eigenvalues of the uh, condition Dirac operator, well okay I mean it's quite amazing that the first value that you find is is fourteen something, the second one is uh, you know so they begin to resemble the imaginary parts of the zeros of zeta. So what one does is to plot the corresponding, uh, you know, spectra, and look at them, and uh, okay, and and uh, see what happens when one changes the value of mu. Okay, so that's what I had shown, and this is what we had done. And for instance, when you take six point five, then you find the you know these um, uh, these values which are incredibly close to to one and then they 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 change eventually you know they cross the interval where they change and they but it gives you the correct range you know the correct range in which you can trust the fact that the projections are almost the same and uh, and then one can compute the corresponding spectrum so here okay you see that the first value <coughs> is uh, is less than it was okay so there, there was some fluctuation here there is 20 and so on so again okay one can compare the spectra and one can see you know some kind of uh, I don't know, some kind of uh, beginning of a resemblance between the two. So you continue with a larger and larger value, and I rem remind you that this is this is lambda square. So, I mean, this is, uh, again, I mean, the lambda is, is, is quite, uh, quite reasonable, quite small. And, uh, okay, so one does that. Okay, this time one finds that, you know, the first value is, is larger. Okay, and one keeps going like that. One compares the spectra. They seem to have, you know, a similarity. I mean, uh, which is uh, which is uh, revealed each time, and uh, so one continues with eight point five, okay, and uh, and one computes again all, all these values and so on. I mean, okay, so here again, one one finds, you know, the the, the very strong similarity, like uh, what you have here. Okay, so I'll continue with nine. I will end with ten point five. So you, you shouldn't think that I'm going forever. So I mean, uh, okay. So and and you see that there is a, there is of course a trustable range uh, in which uh, okay things have a chance to coincide. And okay, for this value nine point five, this is what one finds. 
and uh, the corresponding spectra. And finally, for the value 10.5, okay, this is what one finds. Uh, again, you know the, 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 the part, the place where the, uh, um, until which, if you want, the, the two projections really intersect, which is something between 16 or something like that, 17. Okay, and now you look at the value, and okay, now one can begin to be quite intrigued. I mean, one, one can be really quite intrigued, and uh, I mean, um, in a way, I mean, you know, this is, at this point, we were thinking that uh, there was some some kind of devil that was uh, fooling us, that was making a fool of us, because, okay, I mean, it, it was not clear at all what was going on in the sense that, I mean, uh, even though there was this similarity, you know, between the two spectra, I mean, they were sort of behaving in a, in a very, very similar manner, it was totally unclear what was going on. And, um, I mean, it is at this point, you know, which, um, uh, because I, I, I mean, I, because I mentioned these devils, you know, I, I like to point out to this uh, beautiful drawing by Grothendieck, where, you know, where at some point in his career, he was um, kind of uh, criticizing science. And uh, in this uh, uh, text, I mean, he's saying, you know, that uh, his famous result, which is the riemann rock theorem, is a result which requires about 500 pages in order to be explained. And, uh, and he sees this, if you want, as uh, the sign that uh, somehow, you know, science is, 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 um, is, uh, is, is, is going uh, too far from reality and, uh, and um, too far, if you want, from, from, um, from life, uh, which is uh, threatened and so on. And it's strange to see that, uh, you know, this text that uh, Grothendieck wrote uh, in 1971, is so close to the preoccupations, you know, that, um, for instance, the ecologists have at this point. Okay, so to come back, if you want, we have this very tantalizing fact, which we need to understand. And, uh, I mean, we were lucky uh, with Katya because, in some sense, uh, we were able to understand what is going on, but by varying the value of lambda and... Uh, and um, uh, I mean, by, by chance, if you want, what we did was to plot the corresponding eigenvalues when, and compare them when you, when you change, the, when you alter the number of conditions that you are using to condition the Dirac operator. Because after all, there is absolutely nothing that tells you how to choose the number of conditions that you should put. And uh, what happened? is that when we did that, uh, we found out that uh, uh, a very strange phenomenon was occurring. So when you plot, for instance, if you want the uh, first eigenvalue, what you find out is that uh, if you change from the number of conditioning, the number of conditions that you are using, well, in general, you don't get the same result because, the, the, like the blue graph, it tells you what happens for a certain number of conditions, and the, 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 this one uh, tells you what happens when you change by one this number of conditions. But the amazing thing that we discovered is that for some values of the parameter, well, the two things agree. So there are values of the parameter in which the the first eigenvalue is insensitive to the changing of the number of conditions. And when it happens, like here, for instance, the common value of these two curves, if you want, it's exactly the corresponding imaginary part of the zero of zeta. And it happens several times. It happens not only the first time, but also this one, and so on and so forth. So that was a, a kind of a discovery, if you want, by accident, because we plotted this thing, and then we were amazed to see that. And then we said, okay, well, perhaps, you know, this is just an accident for the first eigenvalue. So we, we computed it for the second eigenvalue. And for the second eigenvalue, exactly the same phenomenon was occurring. So what was occurring is that, you know, you, you, you change the number of conditions. I will show you the, the, the graphs later, but, and when you change the number of conditions, they, for certain values of the parameters, they agree. And when they agree, they, the corresponding value is the same, first of all, which is the first fact. And second of all, this common value is exactly 
the corresponding imaginary part of the second zero of zeta. Okay, and we continued like this. We looked at the four second value and so on. So we sort of uh, got absolutely convinced that this was correct. And, uh, and then we used this uh, method, if you want, to, to um, uh, this criterion here now, to uh, uh, plot the type of values that we were able to compute just uh, like that from this uh, Dirac operator and compare them with the true zeros of zeta. And uh, okay, now if you want, we were getting a much, much, much better comparison between the two. But we were a little bit dissatisfied because this is zeta, if you want, this is what happens for zeta, and this is what happens for Dirac. Okay, and we see here, for instance, that there are two uh, spectral lines which are a little bit too close to each other compared to zeta. So, okay, so we thought more, okay, we thought more, and, um, and in fact, uh, we we uh, we consider several criterions. So the first criterion was the fact that it doesn't depend on, if you want, the choice of the number of uh, conditions. Okay, and uh, and then in order to understand, we looked at the evolution of this eigenvalue as a function of lambda. So we plotted the evolution of the eigenvalues. Okay, and when we plotted this uh, evolution of the eigenvalues, so the curves you want they represent as a function of this uh, mu or lambda square, if you want the first positive eigenvalue, for instance, of this, okay? Now, uh, uh, what happens is the following. What happens is that one sees a much stronger fact than uh, before, because what one sees, if you want, is that these uh, curves, which represent the first eigenvalue, uh, each time they, they manage to touch each other Okay, and and so to form a kind of uh, you know uh, I mean uh, they 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 all come together, and when they all come together, the common value, the point where they touch, is again I mean you know it is the the, the first the first uh, uh, imaginary part of the non-trivial zeros of zeta. So that was very very striking. And, uh, and, uh, and then what we discovered is that, in fact, these points of contact were fulfilling a quantization condition. Namely, when we take uh, these points where things meet, like here, for instance, okay? So well, it's a point which has two coordinates because it has uh, like x, y, if you want. So it has a coordinate x, which is here, and a y, which is uh, the height. And uh, what we discovered is that uh, the, the, all these points, so all these coordinates, they were fulfilling a very strange equation, which is x to the power i y is equal to one. So uh, the next thing to do, of course, was to understand if uh, this quantization condition meant something. And in order to see that, uh, what I show you now, if you want, is uh, the, the the curve which corresponds to the quantization condition in blue, and how it touches here. Of course, because it's a quantization condition, it depends on an integer, because when you write x to the i, y is equal to one, what it means is that uh, the, the, if you want the, the, sorry, the, the product y times log x is an integer. So of course this integer can change. And this means that now you can look, if you want at the next one and so on, and, and they touch in a perfect manner. So they cross, if you want the other curves, they are tangent to the other curves at exactly the right points. Okay, so this is what this is uh, what we discovered, if you want, by okay, just plotting things, and then uh, uh, we we looked at this quantization condition for the first eigenvalue, for the second eigenvalue, for the fourth eigenvalue, and so on. And uh, finally, we understood what it means. So the quantization condition, in fact, is fulfilled by the uh, uh, eigenvalue of the original operator, of the original unperturbed Dirac operator. So in fact, what this quantization condition is telling you is that uh, you can guess that we should compare, in fact, the eigenvector of the condition Dirac operator with the eigenvector of the original Dirac operator. 
And um, the, the, if you want, the, the, actually the eigenvector of the original operator, which has the same rotation number. I mean, one can consider, one can plot in the complex plane the eigenvectors of the um, condition Dirac operator and compare them. So one, they have a rotation number and this rotation number has to be the same. And then what we did, we, we use this criterion if you want, for the first eigenvalue, second eigenvalue, the fourth eigenvalue. And then we use this criterion to uh, now uh, compute from this operator, uh, uh, from the Dirac operator, and compare with, uh, with, uh, spe with zeta, if you want, corresponding uh, spectra. And now you can see that there is really a perfect agreement. Okay, so I mean, after that, of course, this meant that, uh, you know, there was something to understand. I mean, there was really something going on. And uh, uh, so what we, what I will explain now is, uh, I mean, wh what is really going on? And what is really going on is um, the following. I mean, it comes, the conceptual explanation comes from um, um, the Riemann sums in ordinary integra integration of a function of a real variable uh, and the definition of what we shall call uh, scale invariant Riemann sums and the concept which emerged and uh, uh, which is the concept of zeta cycle. So if you want this concept of zeta cycle will be the incarnation of this type of uh, phenomenon which was uh, occurring uh, visually here. So I mean these things will correspond to the zeta cycles. And we shall see what it means mathematically. I mean, it's something quite uh, uh, concrete and and um, remarkable. Okay, so so I mean, the, so here is a explanation. So um, so if you take uh, um, ordinary functions and uh, uh, you assume two things, you assume that the integral is the function of uh, an ordinary variable. Huh? Uh, real variable. So you assume that the integral of the function is zero, and you also assume, but this is less important, that the value of the function at zero is, uh, is zero. Okay. And then you consider this sum, this sum which was already involved when we were talking about the Poisson formula and all that by, by the map E. Now this sum, in fact, what is it? It is, if you want, the Riemann sum when you take the Riemann integral, okay, uh, because I mean, okay, these points are forming an arithmetic progression with uh, u, okay, as a, uh, I mean, the step of the arithmetic progression. So normally you would uh, uh, multiply by u, and okay, when you when u tend to zero, you would tend to the integral, but the integral is zero. And because the integral is zero, instead of having to multiply by u, you can multiply by u one half, okay? And uh, uh, because the integral is, is zero, you still get something which makes sense for values of u, and where you can sum over powers of the scale mu, okay? And uh, and render, if you want this uh, thing, uh, scale invariant. So what you do is you do the Riemann sums, and then, because of the integral being zero, you are allowed to make them scale invariant. So what you are allowed to do is to, to combine, if you want, this sigma mu, this map sigma mu with the map epsilon. Okay. Okay. I mean, you can do that because the sum will now converge. Okay. And uh, uh, of course, for that, you use crucially this, uh, this fact. I mean, the fact that it would converge for uh, k going to plus infinity. This is not a problem because you can take g to have compact support. The difficulty is the and for instance, if f has support in a, in the, in an interval, then this function as as support doesn't go. I mean, vanishes above the interval because you take a sum of n u. Okay, so this is not a problem for you uh, for uh, if you want uh, k positive uh, large. But for k uh, negative, then you are really using the fact that the integral is zero to make sense of the sum. You can use the Poisson formula also if you want. Okay, so these are the scale invariant Riemann sums. 
And uh, uh, then one defines a concept, which is a zeta cycle. So a zeta cycle, what is it? It's a circle with its ordinary metric of length L. So it's, it's just a circle of, of length L, that's all. And uh, what you assume, you call it a zeta cycle, otherwise it's just an ordinary circle. If the subspace of the Hilbert space L2 of the circle which is defined by these scale invariant Riemann sums, okay, is not dense. Well, that's a definition of a zeta cycle. It's a very concrete, very simple definition. And then we have a theorem with uh, Katia Konsani. So, 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 um, uh, our theorem is the following. Our theorem is that if you have a zeta cycle, if now you look at the action of the multiplicative group on the orthogonal complement of this, uh, on this subspace, you know, I mean, uh, this subspace, which is not dense, it has an orthogonal complement. This orthogonal complement is invariant. This is easy to see by scaling. And uh, now the claim is that if you look at the action of the multiplicative group on this orthogonal complement, then it's formed by imaginary parts of zeros of zeta on the critical line. Okay. And the converse is true. Namely, the converse tells you that if conversely, you take um, non-trivial zeros of zeta, which is on the critical line, then whenever you take a circle, which is of length an integral multiple of 2 pi over s, then it is a zeta cycle. And in fact, its spectrum uh, contains this uh, number i s. So in fact, you know, this uh, gives uh, a complete explanation of what was going on before. Because uh, what was going on before is that um, somehow, you know, when we we're looking at these pictures of the uh, uh, eigenvalues, yeah, like here, for instance. So what is going on is that um, um, the link between the mu and the L, which is the length of the circle, is exponential. And, uh, and so, I mean, these points which appear here, they are in the geometric progression. And this geometric progression admits as a, a rate, if you want, the exponential of 2 pi over uh, the first zero of zeta, zeta one, let me say. And, uh, and, uh, and the same holds when you take higher and higher eigenvalues. So in fact, what happens is, is the following is that, you know, these curves are pinned down by these zeta cycles. So they are formed to pass through these points, which form this geometric progression. And this will hold for all eigenvalues. So it will force the spectra to resemble more and more to the zeros of zeta. And uh, I mean, when we did the computation with, uh, with Katia, we also found that um, the, if you want the the range in which one can trust uh, comparison and so on is exactly the same as the range of application of the of the of the Riemann Siegel uh, formula. So the, the Riemann Siegel formula it's a formula which was found in the papers of Riemann by, by Siegel much later on. And um, uh, what was amazing in in uh, our coincidence, if you want, in what we had found was was the fact that we could with the eigenvectors, yeah, we could we could uh, get uh, this perfect control of the 31 first zeros of zeta only by you using the the in the sum in the sum sigma mu, we were only using the um, numbers the integers n, which are two three and four. So of course, I mean you know this looks uh, very strange. On the other hand, when we when you compare. So n equals two, three, and four. I mean, in 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 this sum of f of n x, if you want. But when when you know that it is, it has exactly the relation, if you want, with the Riemann Siegel formula. Then uh, then you find out that the the, the this is um, this is exactly the same, if you want. Well, what we get is a kind of operator theoretic incarnation of this formula. All right. So so this is where we were. Okay, with this theorem, but uh, somehow, okay, I mean, uh, when one sees such a theorem, one would say, fine, okay, there is this fact that 
uh, as a set, you get all the zeros, okay, as a set somehow. But one would, would like to have the spectral interval, spectral realization and so on, uh, um, because here you, you had to, to move the lambda and so on and so forth. So that's what we did with Katya. And uh, um, so, I mean, uh, the, the way we did it is uh, first, I mean, we, we, we had the, the, the impression, if you want, that zeta cycles were like closed geodesics. And the reason is the following is that one can show that if you take a zeta cycle and if you take uh, an integer n, if you take the n fold cover of uh, you know, the, the original zeta cycle, then it is still uh, a zeta cycle. And of course, this is the origin, if you want, of the arithmetic progression or of the geometric progression I was talking about. But somehow, of course, I mean, this uh, is a tantalizing analogy with the geodesics because one knows that, uh, I mean, if one, if you take a geodesic in a given space, you, you, can, you can go along the geodesic several times. I mean, a certain number of traversals, if you want, of the same geodesic. Okay, so, but then, what we uh, discovered with Katya is that, um, in fact, this forced us to connect to an object which we had discovered uh, uh, some time before, and which is deeply related to Zeta by itself. And uh, uh, this is a scaling site. So let me tell you in few words what is a scaling site. And and then we, we we shall we shall see what is uh, the, the the main point. So the scaling site is the following. The scaling site is remember that we have a parameter in in our stuff which is this lambda, okay, or rather let me call it L, which is the, the log, okay, of 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 lambda, let's say, okay, and which is the length of the circle. Now this parameter, of course, it varies from zero to infinity. So what we have is uh, this half line, zero infinity. And uh, because of the n-fold cover, what we have is that if we take one of these values, L, okay, then the natural uh, things associated to it are 2L, 3L, and so on. So if you want, what happens is that what you get is, um, is, a, is the action by multiplication, the action of uh, the multiplicative integers and cross on zero infinity on the half line and the action by multiplication. Of course, I mean, you know, people who know music, they know this action extremely well because multiplication by two on frequencies is passing to the octave, multiplication by three, you know, uh, I mean, uh, up to an octave is uh, transposition and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is something which is a very natural um, object, which is the half line, the half line, zero infinity, if you want, semi-direct product by n cross. But what is this semi-direct product? I mean, it's, this is a space, this is a semi-group. What is the meaning of such a semi-direct product? Well, the meaning of such a semi-direct product is very well understood in terms of topos. So it's a topos, it's a topos. Um, it's, which we called with Katya the, the, the scaling site. I mean, because here I am just talking about the topos. I am not giving you the structure shift, but this scaling site, okay, this topos, uh, which is a semi direct product of zero infinity by n cross, has an amazing property, which is that when you compute its points, uh, these points, they form a non commutative space. So this is a, this is a non-commutative space, and and this non-commutative space, in fact, is it's the zeta sector in the Adel class space. In the Adel class space, which is the the quotient of Adel's, sorry, which is the quotient of Adel's AQ by uh, the action of Q cross. Okay, the multiplicative action of the rational numbers. So uh, uh, it turns out that <laughs> out of nowhere, this parameter space appears, and uh, and 
so this parameter space appears and what does it mean? It means that this Hilbert space of the circle L2 of C, they in fact form a sheaf over this parameter space. Why? Because of course they depend on the length of the circle, like, uh, like here, but also you have the action of n cross. And um, when you consider this subspace, they, of course they form, so this is a kind of constant sheaf if you want, except that you, you use uh, multiplication to, to map one circle to the other, so which is by average. Eh? But, but then what you have is you, you have this family of subspaces, okay, which come from the um, scale invariant Riemann integrals, and they generate a subshift of closed modules, okay. Oh, well, of course, I mean, you know, you make everything to be shifts over smooth functions. And, and, uh, and uh, now the, the, the remarkable fact, if you want, it's the following theorem that we proved with Katya, which is that when you consider the, so because you have a topos, you can take cohomology and you can take cohomology of the topos with coefficients in any shift. And so what we did was to take the cohomology with coefficients in this, this shift is very tricky because if you want um, places where it's non-trivial is just uh, countable. So it's a very, very tricky. It's not a bundle at all. It's a, it's a very tricky uh, shift. And when you compute the cohomology of this shift of the scaling site, of course, with coefficients in this thing, then you find that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's isomorphic to the spectral realization of the critical zeros of zeta. So that's where we stand. That's what we found. And um, I mean, um, uh, in many ways, you know, it's a very intriguing result because uh, of the fact that um, while the zeros of zeta were already occurring in this uh, cohomology, if you want, kind of pointwise, the fact that the parameter space is again uh, intimately related to zeta because it is the zeta sector of the other class space is, is very, very remarkable and intriguing. Okay, so I think, you know, um, um, I mean, okay, there is a long development then, which is a link with uh, veil positivity and which I can summarize extremely quickly by telling you that um, the prolate projection, so the, if you want the veil positivity, something which is an equivalent reformulation of the Riemann conjecture. And uh, uh, what, uh, if you want, what we have discovered with Katya is that when you test uh, the veil positivity on larger and larger intervals of this form in the positive real numbers, uh, then you find that um, uh, you find that there are incredibly small eigenvalues when the lambda increase, and that these extremely small eigenvalues are in fact are in fact explained. So they are, they are if you want, what happens, for instance, is that uh, uh, here I plotted the um, uh, log the log of the smallest eigenvalues, and what you find is for very small values of mu you find eigenvalues which are something like 10 to the minus 48. So, I mean, they, you know, the, you, you can do computations with the computer, but you, you, I mean, how can you be sure that you get something positive? I mean, okay. So, so what we have, uh, ex we have found with Katya is that the explanation for these extremely, extremely small eigenvalues is the same as this projection, the prolate projection, because we compared the, uh, if you want the corresponding uh, eigenvectors. And what we found is that the space of eigenvectors of k lowest eigenvalue for the veil quadratic form correspond to the prolate projection of the spectral triple. Okay, so I think this is uh, the correct place uh, to stop. So I thank you for, for listening. Okay, thank you.